It is said that the average criminal often finds a queer fascination about the scene of his crime, and is bound to return to it at some time in his life. Not that Sidney Bailey, managing director of Bailey's multiple stores, could be called a criminal. It is quite true that he would have liked to have killed Winnie, and also true that swifter action might have saved her from death. But he was not a criminal. At the age of twenty-three, Sidney Bailey, an unknown impecunious salesman, had married the wealthy Miss Dell, sole owner of the Dell Universal store. The unbeautiful businesswoman, past the first flush of youth, had recognised Bailey's keen commercial instincts, and the marriage had been little more than a business partnership. The Dell Universal store became the Bailey Universal store, and soon, backed by Winnie's money and Sidney's brains, had branches in almost every town in the provinces. But the woman was still at the helm. She was Bailey. She kept the reins in her own hands, and the husband was little more than a highly paid manager. How he hated it! He even wished that she would die so that he, and he alone, could be Bailey's. She was a jealous woman and kept an eye on her husband all the time. Often he would have liked to have gone abroad for his holidays, but she always insisted on the same place year after year, a dismal bungalow on the mud flats of the northeastern corner of the Isle of Sheppey. The fifth year of their married life was a stormy one. Sidney wanted to open a branch at Liverpool, but his wife would not hear of it. Quarrels were of almost daily occurrence, and they were hardly on speaking terms when the time for the annual holiday came round. On the island things went from bad to worse, and Sidney found himself wondering how he could get rid of this incubus. Then, in a little second-hand shop in Sheerness, he purchased an old book on magic and witchcraft, and read, half hopefully and half doubtfully, of methods employed in the past ages for willing people to die. That night he walked alone along the cliffs towards the Minster, and all the time he willed, with all the power of which he was capable, that Winnie should die. Next morning they were out swimming together. Suddenly she was caught in a current and whirled away screaming for help. It flashed through his mind that his half-hearted attempts at witchcraft were working. Surely there was something devilish about it. He was a powerful swimmer, and there was still time to save her. Then he thought of himself as the sole owner of Bailey's, and went on thinking until it was too late to do anything for his wife. The current had carried her out to sea. He caught a glimpse of her head bobbing up and down. Her bathing cap had fallen off, and her long hair was floating out behind. Suddenly he swam forward, but the current caught him and he had great difficulty in freeing himself. Her body was never recovered from the water, and the coroner, in sympathising with the mourning husband, highly commended him for his attempt at rescue. That had been thirty years ago, and Sidney Bailey, stout and prosperous, chairman of his own company and of seven subsidiary companies also, had been foolish enough to return to Sheppey. The old bungalow had gone, but he secured lodgings in a comfortable little cottage, and wondered what on earth had induced him to revisit such a God-forsaken spot. Out on the cliffs that night he remembered how he had tried to weave a spell. Queer how it seemed to have worked. A bright moon was shining above Minster Church. He would walk as far as the village and have a drink at the inn. The return journey was tiring, and Sidney was painfully reminded of the fact that he was over fifty. It was an oppressively hot night, and he found himself longing for a swim in the cool sea. Well, why not? He was still a good swimmer, and it would freshen him up before going to bed. Back in the cottage he donned his bathing costume and wrap, and then climbed down to the beach. He felt unreasonably annoyed to see that somebody else was already enjoying a dip. But he consoled himself with the thought that there was enough sea for both of them. 
It was very pleasant in the water. Sidney swam about for some time, and then he thought he would see what the other chap was doing. The moon was very bright, and by climbing on to a breakwater, he could just make out a black head bobbing up and down in the distance. He might as well be friendly, and swim over to the stranger if only for the sake of the company. The distance was more than he had calculated, and it took some time to get near the bobbing head. At last he saw it quite near at hand, and gave a hail. There was no answer. Must be a surly kind of chap, or else he was deaf. Sidney dived and came up very close to the head. He shook the salt water from his eyes, and then he saw, within a few feet of him, a yellow phosphorescent thing with a mass of long black hair. The flesh was eaten away from the face. Tiny crabs crawled in the sockets of the eyes, and a hideous sea snail clung to the place where the mouth had been. But the hair was still recognisable, and he knew the ghastly thing to be the head of the woman who had been drowned thirty years ago. With a gasp of horror he turned and made for the shore, but the thing was after him. He could hear the gentle swell it made as it passed through the water. Something was clinging to his fingers, some weed perhaps. He tried to shake it free. Then he saw that it was black. It was hair, and he was dragging that horrible head. With a scream he tried to release his hand but the hair was twisted too tightly round his fingers. He could feel something cold and clammy pressed to the back of his neck. He could smell a sickening odour of decay. Something tightened about his throat. He was choking. Oh, God! He was choking! Extract from the Lays Down Courier, August 27th, 1934 a shocking fatality occurred just off Shellness on Tuesday evening last. The body of Mr. Sidney Bailey, the well-known director of Bailey's Universal Stores, was discovered on the foreshore. Mr. Bailey, who was staying at a cottage in the vicinity, had evidently gone for a moonlight bathe and may have been overcome by a cramp. One queer feature of this sad case is that a mass of dark brown seaweed was wound about the dead gentleman's neck, but, in the doctor's opinion, this had nothing to do with his death. By an unusual coincidence, Mr. Bailey's wife was drowned at this same spot thirty years ago to the very day.